Hi, everyone. Welcome to Online Voting Theory and Practice by Porter Adams and Emily Stamm. We are at the DEF CON Crypto Village in August 2020. My name is Porter Adams. I'm a software engineer at Blacktop Government Solutions and founder of Disappear Digital. You can contact me on Twitter at Privacy Porter. I'm Emily. I'm a security research engineer at Allstate. I'm also the COO and co-founder of Cybersecurity Nonprofit, or CSMP. And you can find me on Instagram at crypto.emily. So our talk outline, we've got three major pieces. We're doing a quick intro now. And then I will be talking about the practice of online voting. And Emily will talk about the theory of online voting, going into homomorphic encryption, mixed nets, and blind signatures. The scope of our talk, so we're talking about online voting. So not all election security, not even all voting, just online voting. So what do I mean by that? So one form of online voting is anything is called electronic voting or e-voting. And that just refers to something that includes at least some electronics. So the United States, a lot of our voting systems already use e-voting by having computer screens that you can touch. But e-voting does not necessarily mean all online. Internet voting is what people would think of as like 100% online. Internet voting is when it's all gone fully digital and there's no need for in person, uh, anything in person. So safety of voting machines, I'm just gonna refer you to the DEF CON Voting Village. They do a lot of really great work over there. Uh, it's not the focus of our talk. We're gonna be talking more about the internet voting side of things and how it would be possible to vote like entirely online. So this is, this is the biggest question I get is why can't we all vote from our phones? And it's a really like great question. And so we're gonna spend some time explaining the actual reasons why we can't yet. The advantage and why people wanna vote from our phones in the first place uh, the first one is uh, just the convenience factor. It's so much easier if I can sit at home uh, and vote from my phone. It's also especially easier for overseas voters who, if they currently have to vote by mail, that can take a long time for their mail to get in and their votes may not even be counted by the time. Uh, and so it's a lot easier for expats, expats to vote from their phones. It also would hopefully improve voter turnout because it's a lot less effort to download an app on my phone and click some buttons than it is to show up at the polling station. Less human error. Uh, so we all remember the 2000 election with the hanging chads in Florida and not being able to determine which way the votes went. Uh, when we vote on a computer, it's either a zero or one. So it's pretty clear and doesn't leave room for human error when filling out the ballot. So let's talk a bit about usability. So even if we had a totally working mobile app that everyone like could download and use and was all safe and private, which are concerns I'll get to later in the talk. Uh, in Finland in 2008, they had some issues with uh, the user interface. And what happened was people, when they were going to vote, they would see the screen, they would tap through, click all the candidates they wanted to vote for. But at the bottom of the screen was a submit button and about 2% of voters did not see the submit button on the screen and therefore their votes were not counted in uh, the Finland election in 2008. Uh, it is a user interface problem that would be a big issue if people tried to vote but mistakenly like didn't hit submit button. Uh, that would be a concern even if everything else was safe and secure and working. Uh, the other case I want to bring up is uh, Iowa in 2020 at the Democratic Caucus uh, had many problems with their mobile app that they tried to use to help tally up the votes. Uh, we can learn a lot of lessons from that, but one I want to highlight is that some people had trouble even downloading the app correctly. And so even again, if we had like all the security and privacy stuff worked out, there's still some usability concerns with can people download the app? Can people use the app? Um, all of this kind of comes down to like comfort with electronics, 
which a lot of us have here at like DEF CON, but not everyone else in the world is as comfortable as we are with using these things. So here are some of the big concerns. I and mean, security is by far the biggest one. We need to make sure that our election's actually safe. Um, privacy is making sure, like, is it possible to even do a secret ballot online? Because we all know there's so much tracking and surveillance with what we do online that having actually a private vote would be pretty tough. So I'm going to try and answer both of these questions in the remainder of my talk. So first, security, is it safe? There is a huge attack service for anything that's going to be online, some sort of mobile app. And so let's just kind of go quickly over like all the different ways that would need to be like, that could be a voting app could be attacked by. And we would need, if we wanted to do this in practice, to sure up all of these things and make sure that none of these could happen. Uh, so if I was a hacker trying to attack a voting app, I could install a backdoor either as you vote on the client side or when the votes are tallied on the server side. I could create an exploit for the voting app itself or for the phone operating system or for the server code, a server operating system. I could spy on votes by intercepting the connection, maybe with a fake wireless access point or a key logger on the person's device. Uh, there's always social engineering that you'd have to worry about with phishing app. Uh, insider threat, whoever like created the, the code uh, for any of these pieces, you have to watch out for and whoever's running the election. And then just destructive attacks like a de distributed denial of service where the, the app just goes down on the day we're all supposed to be voting. OK, so usually when I'm trying to explain all of this to someone, they always come up with, but banks have mobile apps. And this is a really smart point. And so it, it's worth addressing why uh, even though banks have mobile apps, it's still very tough for a, a voting system to be on a mobile app. So what's the difference between a voting app and a banking app? Uh, first one is identity. When you're banking, basically anyone with your credit card info can go online, order some stuff on Amazon. But when you're voting, we need to make sure that it is really only you. Uh, in terms of security, banking has the benefit of being able to detect fraud kind of later and afterwards. Whereas with an election, if there's any sort of fraud going on, we need to know about it immediately. And privacy is one of the biggest differences where when it's just you and your bank talking and like your bank knows everything and you know all of your own stuff, that's fairly easy to figure out just between the two of you. But for voting, we all have secret ballots, uh, which I'll get to in a little bit. It makes it very challenging for my vote to stay secret while everybody else is still trusting that votes were placed correctly. And then lastly, trust. Uh, in banking, like it's ju really just between you and the bank and other accounts like don't really affect you or like other people using your bank versus uh, in a voting system and a voting app. I need to trust all of the votes from everybody, not just my own. Um, and so trust is, is very different for a voting app. So the privacy challenges specifically of online voting. First, you got the secret ballot. And so what does that mean? more or less that I need to be anonymous when I vote. So no one should be able to figure out based on like, like no one should be able to figure out who I voted for and there shouldn't even be a way for me to prove it to anyone next to each other, next to me or around me. So no one can force me to vote a certain way. Uh, it's very important for our elections. Voter registration is not exactly a privacy challenge. It's like an identity thing, but it's going to be kind of related. Uh, so I include it here. Uh, voter registration, it needs, I need to be uh, very sure that like whoever is submitting the information on this voting app is the person on the ed registration list. And this counts against like double voting, which on the internet is uh, much more, it would be much easier to happen where you could submit something twice and have it accidentally be double counted. And then trust is the big third privacy challenge where all votes must be trusted. 
And typically to ensure that trust, that means lots of visibility. And so the big uh, the challenge here overall is combining the secret ballots with trust. And you have to somehow like include all of the anonymity expected for voters while still having all of the visibility needed for the overall election and everyone to trust the results. And putting these two together digitally is actually extremely tough and will require uh, some really cool math that Emily will talk about in the second half of this talk. Uh, so it's cryptography for online voting is, is the answer. It's going to solve all of our privacy concerns. And I just want to say a big thanks to cryptographer David Chom for inventing a lot of the stuff. I know if you're at the Crypto Privacy Village at DEF CON and have not heard of David Chom before, please look up some of his work. He's done awesome stuff. Okay, so how does Estonia vote online? Especially in the United States, anytime this gets brought up, it's like, how is some other country doing it, but we can't? Uh, the first step's identity. In Estonia, they all have a national ID card that includes a chip on it where they can create digital signatures from, which essentially means their like, government-issued IDs can uh, act as a form of identity on the internet so they can log in using these chips. Although I believe in the last two years, they have switched from hardware chips to an authenticator app, but this still stands that they have some sort of way of converting from your real life presence to your online presence. Secondly, cryptography. Um, Estonia uses a combination of, I think, mixed nets and homomorphic encryption, uh, specifically using Elgamal. And uh, Emily will explain what those are in the, in the later half of this talk. And in terms of trust, Estonia has been voting online since, I think, 2005. And every year they keep making gradual improvements. Anytime security people go check out, there's always something that's broken, which isn't really a surprise. Uh, but Estonia has done a good job of fixing the things that are broken. And over time, it's, the system's gotten a lot better and um, hopefully is, is mostly safe from real threats. They haven't had any giant accusations of uh, election interference. So either that means they haven't caught anyone interfering in their elections, or they've actually been doing a good job. Oh, in 2019, uh, almost a quarter million Estonian, Estonians voted online, which is very impressive numbers and goes to show that this is like possible in the future if it is done slowly and correctly. Now, one big thing to watch out for is crypto cryptographic backdoors. These are, are tough to catch. So Switzerland has been doing online voting and uh, some researchers looked into their MixNet uh, shuffle proof and found uh, a naive implementation of the zero knowledge proof inside of there, which would have allowed for all of the votes to be changed uh, by an attacker. And so just making sure that like every last inch of the app needs to be like very carefully done. And especially when it comes to cryptography, you need the person who's coding it to be aware of all of the cryptographic assumptions and make sure that they are coding in uh, everything properly. So let's look at voting cryptography around the world. Uh, three big ones I want to point out are in Estonia, Switzerland, and then Moscow has some local elections that are online. And Estonia uses a combination of homomorphic encryption and mixed nets, same thing for Switzerland, and Moscow is using homomorphic encryption and blind signatures. Uh, so not too many like countries or places around the world have an online option right now. There are a lot more countries that have tried doing this and quit. Uh, Belgium, Finland, France, Germany, Ireland, Kazakhstan, Netherlands, and Norway are on the list. And the reasons for, for quitting are mostly either every security person says it's not very safe, or 
the the voter trust in an online system is just not very high. And one of the most important things for an election is that voters do trust the system. And so even if online voting is safe, if the voters all think that it's not safe, then it's not a good idea to offer an internet voting option. All right, so now I'll talk about the cryptography behind the scheme. All right, so now I'll talk about the cryptography behind the scenes that makes online voting possible. So some of the considerations we have, the first is security. So preventing attacks, preventing adversaries from tampering with the election and being able to detect faulty voters and centers. The second is robustness. So no small set of servers should be able to disrupt the election. Accuracy, the results should reflect the way people actually voted. Verifiability, we should be able to verify that the votes are accurate. In particular, individuals should be able to verify that their vote was counted correctly. Confidentiality, keeping votes secret is crucial. Um, usability for all ages and speed and efficiency, including casting the votes, processing them and counting them. So there are three types of cryptographic protocols I'll cover in this talk, homomorphic encryption, mixed networks and blind signatures. So first, homomorphic encryption. So homomorphic encryption is computation on encrypted data. So this form of encryption actually allows us to do computations on the data when it's in its encrypted state. Um, and there's been a lot of research into this area and it's very promising uh, because generally our cryptography, when we have our data and it's encrypted, we can't use that data in any way. The only way we can actually make use of it is to decrypt it back into its original form. Um, but with homomorphic encryption, we can actually perform computations on the encrypted data. So this means we could outsource data to cloud environments for processing all while encrypted. Um, we could perform data analysis again while the data remains in its encrypted form. And in particular with election voting, we could obtain a tally of the encrypted votes without actually having to decrypt the individual, individual votes, maintaining privacy the entire time. So uh, to give a little bit more of the mathematics of the scheme, um, so homomorphic, the term actually comes from a math term called homomorphism, which is a map that preserves some structure. So that's what you can kind of think of homomorphic encryption as doing. It preserves some underlying structure enough to perform functions on it. So you have a message, um, you encrypt that message, you perform a function on it, and then you decrypt it. And that would be the same thing as if you apply the function directly to the message. And there's different types of homomorphic encryption. Uh, generally, they are categorized based on what kinds of computations you can perform, whether it's just um, partial, whether it's addition, multiplication. Um, but we even have fully homomorphic encryption. And that actually can perform arbitrary gates and depth, meaning really arbitrary computations. The only practical and secure fully homomorphic encryption implementations currently are based off of lattices. So lattice cryptography, um, it's this new, relatively new form of cryptography that is um, beginning a lot of attention recently, partially because it's quantum secure cryptography, um, meaning that it's secure against quantum computers. And it's actually most of the finalists in the post quantum cryptography NIST competition are lattice based. And lattice cryptography has some very strong security assumptions, um, especially compared to our classical cryptography like RSA. It's also very flexible and efficient. Generally, the main downside is that it has large key sizes, but depending on the scheme, they're not even always that um, much larger than RSA. So lattice cryptography is very important um, for the fully homomorphic encryption, but we'll also touch on it when we come back to blind signatures. So I just wanted to mention what that is. And so now we'll turn back to homomorphic encryption and voting in particular. So how does it help? Um, so we can tally the votes in the encrypted state, which means we take all the votes in, in their encrypted state, add them together, and then decrypt the result. 
And because of the homomorph encryption, we get the same result as if we decrypted them separately and added them together. So this allows voters to maintain their privacy. Um, there's also a protocol that allows us to, allows voters to verify their votes. And even if we don't use homomorphic encryption in the election, we can still use it for ballot comparison. So ballot comparison is very important um, in the election process to inspire voter confidence by comparing ballots and the electronic records. And the way we could use homomorphic encryption is this in this um, is that we can actually do this comparison on the votes in their encrypted state. Um, so we would inspire voter confidence without actually giving any information about the votes. Um, and how this is done now is the votes are anonymous, but even still with anonymous, um, with not tying them back to the individuals, um, you can still find patterns. So it would be more secure if they were in their encrypted state. So next I'll talk about mixed networks. So mixed networks, also called mixed nets, are routing protocols that use a chain of proxy servers, mixes, to take in messages from senders and send them to receivers in some random order. Additionally, they use encryption at each state and it makes it harder to trace. And you can also think of it as being kind of like a Russian doll, some nested encryption going through. So there's two types, there's the decryption mix net. Um, so that's where you do all the encryption in the beginning and then you partially decrypt and mix at each stage. Um, there's also re-encryption where you re-encrypt and mix at each stage and do, do the full decryption at the last round. Um, and there's also shuffle and decrypt proofs for verifications as well. So lastly, we'll talk about blind signatures. So just to recall, a digital signature provides authenticity. So verifying that you're talking to the person you think you are, verifying a known sender and integrity, verifying that the message you're receiving has not been altered in transit maliciously or accidentally. Um, so how it works is one party signs the message and creates a signature with a private key. And then the other party will verify that with a public key. So with blind signatures, it's a digital signature where the message is masked or blinded and then sent and then signed. So blind signatures can then be verified against the original message the same way digital signatures are. The key difference is that with blind signatures, um, the person signing them doesn't know the contents of the message. So voting is actually a common analogy with blind signatures. So imagine you have a voter and they complete an anonymous ballot, which they then pl place in an envelope with their credentials. They hand that envelope to an official who signs it and the signature of the official imprints through the envelope onto the ballot and they return that envelope to the voter. The voter then places the ballot in a different unmarked envelope before submitting it. So now the message was correctly and sufficiently signed by an official without the official having to know the contents of the message. So it provided the authenticity and integrity but maintain the confidentiality. So to talk a little bit more about the scheme um, in a less analogous way, what actually happens. So a user has some message D and they blind the message to get a new message D star. And that's what they send to the signer. The signer then uses the private key to generate a signature sigma star for that message D star and returns it to the user. The user can then create from Sigma star, a valid si signature Sigma corresponding to the original message. So any recipient can now validate the signature Sigma as they would any other signature. And the signer gets no information about the contents of the message or the actual signature. And there's different mathematics behind blind signatures. Um, there are RSA based options. Um, I don't, I wouldn't recommend um, using these because with where we are right now, if we're implementing new technology, we want to be looking as far ahead as possible. Um, and in the long run, RSA is not secure against quantum computers and just as not secure compared to these other types of schemes. Um, but there's also some attacks on the RSA based blind signatures. 
So I'm mostly going to focus on the lattice and the multivariate base. So the lattice-based blind signatures, um, again, they're post-quantum secure, and they rely on similar problems, similar types of schemes as those that are finalists in the NIST post-quantum cryptography competition. Um, so we have a lot of faith in these lattice-based schemes, and we can create blind signatures from them. Um, additionally, multivariate, there's a scheme called the rainbow scheme that's a finalist in the NIST post-quantum cryptography signature schemes competition. Um, so again, believed to be post-quantum secure, and we can turn this scheme into a blind signature scheme. And there's a lot of benefits to multivariate cryptography, such as having very fast and short um, signatures. And this diagram just kind of shows how the rainbow scheme works. Um, Essentially, you have a message W, um, the hashed message, and you recursively obtain um, inverses of these functions to get the signature Z. Um, and then that signature Z can be verified by using the public key function and just applying that to see if you get the correct message back. Um, with blind signatures, there's just an extra some extra steps in this process, you use a special function called R that actually, um, by using that, you create the blind aspect of it, and then you use, use zero knowledge proofs at the end as well um, as part of the verification proof. Um, so a little bit more complicated, but again, very similar mathematics. So in summary, we talked about homomorphic encryption, so computation on encrypted votes, which allows us to tally the votes in their encrypted form. And it can use different types of cryptography, um, but lattice space is one that is post-quantum secure and very flexible. Then we talked about the mixed networks protocol, where you have a nested series of encryption or re-encryptions and shufflings. And this way you cannot determine which person the vote came from. And there's also a range of underlying public key cryptography mathematics that I didn't go over, but the protocol itself is fairly flexible. And finally, we talked about blind signatures. So this is where you create a valid signature without knowing the contents of the message. So you're verifying authenticity and integrity of a vote while maintaining confidentiality of a voter. And we talked about lattice and multivariate based schemes. To summarize everything, is it possible theoretically? Yes, eventually. Cryptographers will help us get it right, as well as security people. Is it ready in practice? Not yet in the United States. Let's start small scale, and maybe eventually we'll be able to have more voters vote from their phones. So thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for coming to the talk.